Okay, this is part two of a video in which I give some uh, rambling, improvised, uh, one in the morning type answers to some questions posed by my friend uh, Randall Kona as part of a Carbon Copies workshop on mind uploading, brain computer interfacing, AGI, and so forth, which was held in a, in a part of the world far away from me. So, in lieu of showing up and rambling semi-coherently at the audience, I'm uh, doing so on on video from afar. So let me continue with some of uh, Randall's questions. First question, what do I think about brain-computer interfacing as a tool to improve AI safety? What impact would high-speed brain-computer interfacing have on AI or rapidly self-evolving AI or AGI? All right, well, you know, brain-computer interfacing could either greatly aid with AI safety or could terribly harm the prospects of safe AI it really depends on, on how it's used, right? I mean, on the beneficial side, if we want our AGIs to richly understand human values, you know, connecting to the human brain is going to be a really nice way for an AGI to suck some values out of, out of the human brain, right? I mean, of course, AI can learn human values by watching people and by enacting human values by controlling robots and other agents in the human world, but to, to the extent that uh, that an AI can inspect what happens in the brain and make them to understand human values even better than than human beings do in, 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 in many senses. So that that's quite positive. On, on the on the other hand, you know, you, you if we look at, you know, selling, spying and killing is the main pursuits of the AI sphere in the world in the world today, given the big tech companies and governments that are controlling so much of AI today. I mean then how could brain computer interfacing be used for selling, spying and killing? Well you, you could invent a lot of interesting ideas that way and would they would they lead toward AGIs that are going to be positive or beneficial toward uh, you know humans, other sentient beings as as they expand their intelligence. Well, quite quite possibly not, right? Randall's next question. Could you create high bandwidth brain computer interface without first having a neural prosthesis or a completely artificial brain? Hmm. Well I mean, I think that the brain is very adaptive and probably if you stuck a bunch of data from a computer into it, you know, the brain would make some interesting sense of it. I mean, it would then be no longer a legacy human brain. You, you might, I mean, the, the more complex and novel the data coming into the brain is, the more the brain would have to morph itself to encompass this data, but that would be quite interesting. You're creating a hybrid mind. I mean, of course, you get to a certain level where the brain no longer has the capacity to adapt to what you're trying to interface with it. But what what exactly that level is, you know, we don't know enough about neuroscience or information processing in general to know that now it probably will be determined by experiment. I probably will not be the first person to volunteer for that experiment but i'll be i'll be fairly early on right so this will be quite interesting to see i do think it's important to remember that you know once you get into nanotech femtotech the amount of intelligence you could pack into a grain of sand would probably be a quadrillion times the human brain and a trillion or something times any brain computer hybrid because I mean, the human brain is a very inefficient way to do information processing, creativity, probably an inefficient way to manifest consciousness compared to, you know, what's possible in an engineered physical system, permissible, even according to the known laws of physics, let alone to what the laws of physics may be understood to be after a, a singularity. So while, you know, upgrading human intelligence 
by connecting brains to computers and creating hybrid minds is interesting. This is, you know, in the scope of post-singularity minds, these hybrids are going to be closer to a monkey or a frog than they are to a super, a super, a super intelligence, right? So it's an interesting thing to do in terms of the transition between here and post singularity minds, but in in in, in the end, it's just a, a baby step toward the toward the singularity. Randall's next question: Do you see ways in which whole brain emulation and artificial human brain? might immediately present an existential risk to humanity. Well, I mean, if you if you emulate some nasty human and then copy that emulated nasty human a million times and connect its body to, you know, selling, spying, and, and killing machines around the world, this, uh, this may not be good. But again, it's not really about the technology. It's, uh, it's about, it's about, how it's used, right? I mean, my my guess is that if you compare a whole brain emulation to an AGI built according to some, you know, rational, non-brain emulating architecture, like oh, let's say an open cog system that works really well, I would guess there's both more benefit and more risk in the engineered non-brain emulating design because I mean the human brain is not made for self-modification when you start enhancing intelligence of certain parts of it other parts are going to break and I mean you're going to wind up not being able to enhance its intelligence tremendously without basically replacing it with a totally different architecture because I mean the human brain is an adaptation to certain resource constraints and once you release those constraints, you know, you're going to need to change the, the architecture to manifest the intelligence uh, that is possible with the new expanded set of constraints. So I, I think, on the other hand, a, a rationally architected AGI, such as what we're trying to do with OpenCog, or could be something different than OpenCog, with something engineered with self-modification and, you know, rational self-understanding in mind, this sort of AI system, it's going to be able to reprogram itself, it's going to be able to study itself, it's going to be able to replace one module with an, up, with an upgraded module, it's going to be able to audit all its states and then rationally make decisions as to what possible improvements of it itself to try. It can go far, far ahead of a human augment with a brain-computer interface or a uploaded emulated human and it could go far ahead of these human-esque post-human minds in a good or, or, or a bad direction. Again, the technology has a lot of potentials. It depends on what you do with it. And of course, what you do with it will guide what it does with, with itself, right? And Randall asks, See, rapid self-improvement is often described in the context of utility function optimization and reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning may be accomplished only in a few of the many complex subsystems of the brain, like neocortex and cerebellum. So do you think a whole brain emulation can rapidly self-improve? Well, that's, that's a really delirious and misguided question, Randall. I mean, I, 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 th I think it's true only a little bit of what the brain does is reinforcement learning. And that's why the brain can be intelligent, because reinforcement learning is a terrible overall paradigm for general intelligence. I mean, reinforcement learning is only a tiny bit of what the brain does, just like deep hierarchical pattern recognition, like current deep neural nets do, is only a very small part of what the brain does. So, yeah, I mean, rapid self-improvement can go much more rapidly if it's following methodologies besides just re reinforcement learning. The reasons that the human brain can't rapidly self-improve are more that it's, it's architected in a, you know, a contorted and limited way where each part is dependent on the other parts and each part and their dependencies evolve to work 
within certain processing constraints, which are compatible with the transhuman intelligence that, that we want to build. I mean, you know, it's, it's just like you can't take a horse and double its size and, and, and have, it, have it still work. I mean, if you, if you increase the short-term memory capacity of human to 10,000 instead of 7 plus or minus 2, the connection between short and long-term memory and medium-term memory isn't, isn't going to work. You know, the, the relation between declarative and procedural knowledge and short-term memory isn't going to work. A lot of other changes will have to be made all around the brain. Whereas if you have a rationally architected AGI system and you increase its short-term memory capacity, you know, if it's written well, you could probably just use some automated code rewriting system to tweak the other parts of the, of the AGI system to, to properly accommodate for the expanded uh, short-term memory of the AGI system. So I think there are limitations in speed of self-improvement that you're going to get in a brain emulation or brain incorporating AGI system, but these aren't to do with the, you know, limitations of adherence to the extremely narrow and limited paradigm of reinforcement learning. These are more to do with just the constraints of being an evolved system as opposed to an engineered system, mostly. I mean, Evolved systems can evolve, and evolution is slow and messy. Engineered systems can be engineered, which can be much faster. Engineered reflective systems can self-engineer, which is going to be really, really nice and way faster than and way more efficient than the the mess of of evolution. Randall asks. Uh, there's an argument cautioning against a strong push for neurotechnology, no brain emulation, because work in those areas might accelerate advancement toward runaway self-improving AI. Well, as I already said, I, I think these per this particular line of research of whole brain emulation is a terrible approach to self-improving AI. So if you think self-improving AI is bad, you should be in favor of AI through brain emulation. If you want self-improving AI, you should be looking at engineered AI systems that are designed for rational reflection and self-understanding and, 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 and self-modification. Next question from Randall. There's an argument, the ultimate solution for AI safety is a scenario for human and AI becoming inextricably entangled. Well, again, there's no reason to think that will guarantee safety. There could be good and bad aspects. I mean, you, if you're taking, you know, a very powerful artificial cognitive system and coupling it with these reptilian slash mammalian motivational systems and emotional systems we have in humans, this could be pretty damn nasty, right? I mean... An open cog system as one example of a non-brain based system. It has a certain set of goals. They don't drive all dynamics in the system, but they drive a significant amount of it. They have a certain set of goals, and then the system rationally using probability theory and logic chooses which actions are most likely to achieve its most important goals in the current context. I mean it's not driven by its body and its emotions and its instincts to the extent that a, a human a human being is. And I think something like that is probably going to be, if it's done right, it's going to be safer than some weird Frankenstein thing, Frankenbot thing with these evolved motivational and emotional system latched into some artificial cognitive system. So I... My, we don't know because we haven't built an AGI based on the human brain or brain computer interfacing or open cog or anything else yet, right? So we don't know there's tremendous and very hard to reduce uncertainty here. But my, my own instinct and my intuition, and I've thought about this a lot, is that it's going to be a lot more dangerous to mix up in one system all this nasty mammal reptile stuff with artificial cognition. I mean, I, I think you want the the rational, reflective, self-modifying AGI to understand human culture and human values. 
and to have compassion for humans, but you don't really want it to be a human. You want there to still be humans, but you don't want to try to do something screwy, like make it so the smartest and most powerful minds are some sort of human AGI Frankenbot thing. I mean, you want to accept that humans are just a limited form of mind. I mean, there's beauty in this limitation as well as hideousness in this limitation but that's what we are and one of our beauties is that we can build fundamentally superior minds which are compassionate toward us and can self-understand self-modify and self-improve in ways that we intrinsically cannot due to the way that we evolved and we can then coexist with these super minds but we can't be these super minds and trying to create a super mind that's tied in with the human mammal and reptile control system is far more risky than most other, maybe than any other technology on, 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 on the horizon. Final question from the great Randall. In your opinion, what should humanity do to maximize its long-term chances for survival and thriving? Give Ben 50 quadrillion dollars. No, well, Right. Apart from that, I mean, very clearly, what humanity should be doing is spending a large percentage of its resources on globally beneficial applications of advanced technologies, including AI, nanotechnology, neurotechnology, and, and, and so forth, and on trying to create machines with compassion toward humans and deep, rich understanding of the full breadth of, of, of human values. And we shouldn't be, you know, putting the bulk of our AI resources into selling, spying, and killing. Uh, we, we, sh we shouldn't be putting so little resources into medical applications of advanced technology, into education, into agriculture, into, you know, artificial poets, scientists, social workers, uh, nurses, preschool teachers, and philosophers, and, 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 so, and so forth. So, I, I mean, if you look at it from the outside and you had a species that was on the verge of creating, you know, the first minds more intelligent and powerful than itself, you might think a large percentage of that species' resources was going into, you know, figuring out theoretically how to make these new minds be as beneficial as possible for the universe and the multi, multi, multiverse and for the, the species doing the creating and, and to prototyping different kinds of beneficial engineered minds and to making sure that engineered minds, as they increase in intelligence year by year, were working closely in a positive and, and compassionate way with the species that created them. I mean... Instead, almost all AI development now is driven by commercial or military ends, and the same for medical technology, the same for nanotechnology. I mean, almost all this technology is being developed either so that one country can achieve like military hegemony over other countries, or so that one company can extract money from other people. So, that, I mean, the fact that our technologies are being developed mostly out of tribalistic or greed-based motives clearly isn't good. We want to be developing these technologies, you know, in a way that is, is motivated and is explicitly driving toward broad benefit for humans and for, for the other minds that, that, are, that are going to be created. That, that's not what we're doing. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to develop advanced technologies in a way that, that will help all of humanity and will help the superhuman minds that, that we're going to create and, you know, throw in the animals and plants and the rest of the ecosystem and other, any other aliens we account in this or other dimensions as well. But most, most development of advanced technologies is being driven by very narrow sort of tribalistic or ego-based goals. And this, uh, this is not optimal. Of course, you can't solve that problem top down all at once. Hopefully you can solve that problem by unleashing sort of new methodologies into the world. I mean, just as open source transformed the software world, you know, perhaps decentralized AI networks can transform the, the 
AI world and cause AI to self-organize in a way that's more inclusive, democratic, and, and participatory, so that as AGI emerges out of neuro AI, it's it's emerging with input from you know users, developers, and and the uh, participants in AI around the world, and is 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 reflecting a broad range of applications and feeding on a broad range of, of human insights and, and feelings and, and in, in, intuitions. All right, it's about 1.30 a.m. here. Clearly I'm becoming less and less lucid as this ramble uh, continues, but hopefully uh, I've given you some flavor of my views on these issues. So thanks, Randall, for uh, inviting me uh, to participate via video. And uh, hopefully next time I can show up in person.